I mean, I, I'm All right. glad you guys are here. This is awesome. You're on. Yeah, ready to go? Yep. Hello. I am uh, Matt Beebe. I work at Midget Motors in Norwalk, Ohio. I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, King Midgets. And it's a small car that was built back in between the 40s and uh, 1970s when they quit making them. And uh, the reason I'm here talking about an old vehicle is that uh, it was ahead of its time as far as uh, being a small vehicle. All, the, all vehicles are going toward a small vehicle for a lot of different purposes, just, you know, gas mileage, you know. Um, but the, re the, the reason, the, I mean, the reason we are doing it is because uh, we have alternative fuel, you know, motives. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the motives behind that's obvious, you know, like, we don't know what the future of uh, advanced fuels are going to be. Uh, so you've got to prepare for electric, natural gas, uh, biodiesel, ethanol, uh, and of course you still got to work with gasoline for a long time. So you've got to build a platform that can cover all of those things. So what we're doing basically is developing a kit car uh, based off of this old King Midget. Um, because it's the right size and it's the right weight for for what we're doing um, for for those type of capacities. And I don't have any slides about any alternative fuel with me today, but this is this is the this, this is the thought process I'm going. I'm going to tell a story, and you guys need to follow me on this. Okay. Um, basically, uh, it starts with well, I mean, this is a picture of a king midget. Uh, this is the one. This is the one that we're building the kit off of. Um, this was the '57 to '70 model. Um, but it started with two guys who used to fly a lot of airplanes, and uh, they they sat around drinking a lot of coffee and reading a lot of popular science magazines, and they just knew that flying cars were going to be the thing in the future. And uh, you know, maybe they were a little. Maybe they they still will be right someday. You know, but they didn't have the means to do it at the time. They started an airplane directory and they were selling a lot of used airplane parts from a lot of crashed airplanes. Then they went into this uh, Midget Motors directory where they sold a lot of small engine parts. and Basically, small manufacturing like Kig. They were up against the giants back then. It's Ford, GM. They were hitting it hard, you know, late 40s. At the same time they are doing this type of stuff. So, um... Basically, I'm proposing this the same thing is going to happen again because we have this same kind of mentality. Um, you know, King Midget started, they had, you know, they started at a ground level. Uh, they dealt with parts, they, they sold this kit originally with just the hardware. They didn't have wheels, they didn't have any body, all they had was the frame and, and the axles, basically, and like a steering wheel. And, and then as it went on, they just they formed entire crate kits. These guys over here on the right went all the way across the country and there's a uh, two, two person, you know, like they probably, I think the, the horsepower in this thing, I mean, you could put any engine you wanted, but they had like about quarter, like three quarter power, you know, three quarter horsepower engines in these things. Ridiculous type of stuff that they were working with. Um, once they moved on, this is the second one that they made. This had uh, the nine and a half horse engine in it and it was one cylinder engine. And that's, this is kind of where they got the ball really rolling, and they had a, a good factory going by then. This is, this is the, last, this is the mo last and most popular model that they did. Um, these are advertisements in the popular science magazine that they used to read. They, they put a lot of advertisements in their own directory because they made most of their profits off of uh, publishing a directory for small car parts. They just had guys, you know, uh, they just published the advertisements for free, and then they sold the directories for like 25 cents a pop. And that's how they just kept this whole thing going, is they sold this publication the whole time. And then they started selling their own things to kind of facilitate those extra parts that they had laying around. This is the old, this is the old factory where they produced many, many of these King Midget cars. And this is where we are now. We're in Norwalk, Ohio. And uh, we're, you know, basing everything off of this Model 3 uh, version of the King Midget. And we want to make alternative fuel vehicles. We want to make... We want to make it so that anybody can build a car. We want to make it um, so it's easy for, almost for educational purposes, if not, you know, for practicability of just driving around town. 
these are two of our early prototypes. Um, 2005 was the green one, and then um, you know the next year after uh, 2006 was the blue one, and that was about the time span we did that in. Uh, you know, this this is a king midget. Some more pictures of them, <laughs> and uh, they're small in comparison to some of the other antique cars on the market. Uh, you know, this is a cute picture. I thought, all right, this is us in the lab or in our shop in in Norwalk there, and you know, just welding the parts together, um, having a good time. That's dad. Uh, that's my dad. It's just us two in the shop, basically building these things. And uh, uh, we have a good time with that. Uh, all right, this is basically the, the chassis we're, we're using right now. We've gone through about five prototypes up to this point where we've used, we've built chassis from the ground up. We've uh, taken some other like ATV type of vehicles and tried to trans, you know, transfer them over. But this seems to be the, the, the one that's really hitting it good. We're basically just taking the chassis and then just cutting it in half and then you know add in about eight inch lengths weld it back together and you got and then this is um, this is the other part of the chassis that we're building this is basically the mounts for the body itself now when you combine these two you basically have a roll bar and you have uh, you know basically the whole mounts for the whole rest of the body so you take those two and then you have this guy now this is this is our original chassis design about a year ago, um, and this it worked out pretty good, and we've actually redesigned it since then. Um, I don't know if you saw in those last pictures, but we were actually setting down um, the the front the front part of it. Basically, the whole front part we assemble by itself and then lay down on top of it afterwards. Uh, you know, disc brakes. It's got a. It has a lot of new modern parts in it. Basically, anything that you can get from a, a golf, golf parts, a golf cart parts store, um, you can fit on this vehicle because that's basically one of the reasons why we're using this chassis. Is because you, all the parts are available. We're selling parts right now for all the old ones, and a lot of those parts aren't available anymore. You got wheels that have old hubs in them that nobody's making anymore, and if they do, they're selling them for astronomical prices, you know. Um, and then, yeah, more shots of, of working on it, and this is, this is, this is the, uh, the assembly line, as we like to call it, where we're actually taking the, uh, the front part that we assembled first and then set it down on it uh, so as to make it like a two-part process. Uh, that's some more pictures of that from the other side. All right, now this is, this is, this is my idea. Uh, <laughs> this is where uh, King Midget can fit into a bigger society or uh, just at large, basically. Like, this is why we need King Midgets in our community. And basically, it starts with car sharing. Car sharing allows us to let the people drive these cars. And if, uh, if people can drive these cars more, I think they'd find that they're a lot of fun to drive around kind of introduces them to the idea of smaller cars. And that's kind of where we're at in the technology right now. There's a lot of people, you know, proponents of this thing, but nobody's, mo nobody wants to jump in feet first, buy an entire small car, and, and be like, well, this isn't all that great. Car sharing is great because you can just, you know, if you want a King Midget one day, or you want a small car one day, or you want a luxury car one day, or you want, you know, a truck, all of, you know, obviously, I mean, this is just car sharing. You guys, uh, it's a good idea anyway. And the more people that talk about it, the better, I think, you know. And then there's open source. This is another huge part of this. Uh, we need to get people together and start building these type of things. Because we're offering this as a kit, basically. And the more people that we have building these things, the better. Obviously, you guys are familiar with probably Linux. This open source ecology just started a couple years ago, and that's basically just taking uh, simple machines, putting all the plans on Wikipedia so that anybody can just download the plans and build this stuff. And they're building tractors, they're building uh, you know, CNC machines, ovens, 
basic civilization starting type of program, you know. They, their whole goal is, is a really good one, and it's just put an entire civilization starter packet on one DVD. You know, that's, that's their idea, and it, I, I like it, you know, but they also have automobile plans on that, too, that you can just build, like little three-wheelers, all like composite cars, um, you know, alternative fuel type stuff, they're using uh, hydrogen fuel cells and things like that. Um, but cooperative communities. We need to build communities stronger. We need to find out what it is in the communities that we need and build those. We need, basically we just need people's time to come in and, and help out. And I've seen this when I lived over in Kent for a few years. Uh, I mean, the, the natural foods co-op, I mean, obviously there's a lot of demand for that type of, you know, like people want organic food in Kent. People want food that, you know, doesn't have GMOs or any of that jazz. So like, you know, a place, the community just builds this place to kind of fill a need. And I'm about to get to this point, small manufacturing. This is, this is the need that we have currently and a lot of the communities all across northern Ohio really uh, as the auto, automotive industry is left. This is a, a gap that's basically brought on by the assembly lines themselves. Now what built us up originally was obviously the assembly lines and they were a great thing and they gave us great amount of uh, building capabilities. But now the jobs are so simple anybody can do them across the board. You don't need any skill set. Uh, the guys that they hired right off the bat when the assembly line started had enormous skill sets. Like these guys, 99% of the people worked on farms at the turn of the century. Let me see that. This guy. And, uh, and now you know, like we're basically educated to either go to college or go to work and there's no real like skill set, there's no practic practicality behind it. And behind the assembly lines, if we um, basically we're going to have to re, uh, relearn skill sets in this country and we need to do that by providing these buildings with cooperative communities, online uh, open source plans we can teach ourselves this type of stuff. You know, this isn't hard stuff. These are simple machines. And the manufacturing of these simple machines on a small scale are going to be way cheaper than any kind of, uh, you know, large scale operation. Uh, plus, it's not a planned obsolescence type of uh, uh, manufacturing, which is basically, you know, we're, we're just using, using resources over and over and, but, you know, just to make money. But we're not, like, conserving any of our money. We're not conserving any of our resources at the same time. Plus, we're losing huge skill sets. Um, this is why I, need, I, I think this can happen. We need to build, you know, simple machines. I mean, this is a picture of a tractor all the way up on the left. And that's a picture of a rotor that you can attach to the tractor. There's a, uh, an oven down here, a furnace, uh, rollers, any kind of like machine shop type tool, any kind of 3D printer type tool. The plans are out there to make these right now for way cheaper than you can buy them, just for cost of the materials. And I mean, th these are just huge, huge little sectors of, uh, <laughs> huge little sectors of uh, what we can do to educate people and educate ourselves about this. Because we need to have these skill sets to start teaching, you know, our kids these type of things in school. Like, that's one of the things that bothered me about, like, high school classes in general is just, I got up to about pre-calculus and by then I had no idea what I was even using that stuff for. You know, there was no, I have no practical training in building any of this stuff, you know. Uh, I hang around the shop with my dad and that's the only way I know most of it, you know. Like, he has all, he has all the tools sitting around, so they're just there. But these skill sets where people, back when King Midget just started, they were selling kits where people were like, well, you have to build the wheels, or you have to build the body, or you have to build this part of the car. And people today don't buy stuff like that. They don't buy kits that aren't fully manufactured. You can't, you can't sell like the bolts and the plans and have somebody just go build it, unless they own a machine shop, unless they've been skilled in that type of guild. Um, do I have anything else on here? 
But uh, yeah, king midgets. I'll get back to some pictures of some king midgets here. Uh, that's us in the shop there. That's all the chassis work. Uh, yeah. And this is, uh, I think this is a perfect vehicle for this type of small manufacturing. Uh, because basically, it's a 50 mile per hour car, it's a small in-town car. It can get done the jobs of most people's traffic. I feel like uh, the way the job market is going, it's going to a direction where there's going to be a lot less jobs that we know of today. Like the jobs are all changing. And I think that we're going to have to step back in a lot of different ways. We're going to have to step back uh, historically in that um, more and more people are wanting to do small farms. More and more people, like this is the type of work that uh, I think more and more people are going to want to get after. Because people just want to work inherently. If there's, if 75% of jobs go away in, in manufacturing jobs because of robots or robotic technology, I mean, what are people left to do except for, you know, just make food survive, you know, make, make what they do. They, uh, you know, what are people's dreams besides just, I mean, growing up, having a family, you know, being able to provide for them. Um, you got to have that satisfaction of work, though. And I think that's why we need to step back. And, and it's, it's, we got to step back to go forward, though. It's not like I want to stop any kind of technology, because I think all the technology that's happening, you know, like public Wi-Fi, robots, all of these things are just inherently uh, in inevitable. It's an inevitable situation that's going to happen. Whether we, we try to force it or not, or whether we talk about it or not, it's just happening. Um, and it's at, happening at an ever greater speed. We just have to keep up in the science news every day just so we can kind of gear ourselves towards that type of thing. But I think that these old methods are, are very valuable uh, to have, like old farming skill sets, practical mechanic skill sets. This is what's going to be uh, fruitful in uh, fulfilling our satisfaction for living, basically. You know, like, we, we, we want to work, we want to have fun doing it, and, you know, King Midget Kit Cars. That's what we do, and um, I'd like to open up the floor for questions.